Good afternoon. Let me welcome you all. I'm Ashutosh Varshne, I'm Director of the of India Initiative and Professor in Political Science as well as the, at the Watson Institute. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a true pleasure um, and an honor to welcome Gyanendra Pandey, our speaker today. He is a towering intellect in the field of Indian history. <clears throat> He has done path-breaking research and has also led pioneering uh, intellectual, uh, collective intellectual initiatives. Uh, of the various research projects, the most important, uh, at least from my perspective, is his book, The Construction of Communalism in Colonial North India. Uh, the book taught us that uh, um, looking back, uh, you can say it's become conventional wisdom, but for the first time, really, that uh, British colonial power created many of the categories that came to be associated with Hindu-Muslim relations, and the category construction itself made those relations unduly rigid, even violent. The immensity of colonial power um, was reflected not only in how coercion was used, but also in how knowledge categories were generated and then routinized, um, especially in administrative conduct, thus acquiring a power of their own. <clears throat> the most remarkable chapter of that book, again from my perspective, while I was doing work on Hindu-Muslim relations, I, it was a very striking chapter, was entitled The Bigoted Julaha, The Bigoted Weaver. Professor Pandey documented the claim extensively that if you look at British archives about the United Provinces in northern India, they suggest uh, multiple ways, at least two or three ways, two ways actually in that chapter, in which the community of weavers could have been interpreted. But the British privileged only one of those interpretations, that of the bigoted weaver. Um, another well-known project of his intellectual life has been a collective project called the Subaltern Studies. He co-led that project right from its inception, and I think 13 volumes have come out by now. <clears throat> the Subaltern Project revolutionized the writing of Indian history, <clears throat> Its fundamental claim was that to write a fuller history of the colonial period in India, in South Asia, no? scholars needed fundamentally to interrogate the official archives. Instead, the archive of memory, songs, folklores, diaries had to be excavated painstakingly and deeply probed. This idea traveled far and wide, becoming conventional wisdom in many fields of inquiry, as we know now. <clears throat> the work he's presenting here today is, to paraphrase Albert Hirschman, an essay in trespassing. <clears throat> he has of late turned his gaze towards comparative questions linking both India and the United States. He has lived in, it, in the United States since 1998, first as a professor of anthropology and history at the Johns Hopkins University, and since 2006 as a professor at Emory. We will follow a slightly different format than is customary in the seminar. After Gyan concludes his talk, we will have two 10-minute comments from the discussants, whom I shall introduce later. Um, and I might also invite uh, further comment from uh, some distinguished members of this audience. Um, Gyan is currently the Arts and Sciences Distinguished Professor at Emory. The talk today is based on a book that came out a day before yesterday. The title of the talk is Modern Prejudice, Vernacular and Universal. Please wel welcome Professor Gyan in Pandey.
Um, and thank you to Ashtosh, an old friend, and to others uh, at Brown who've invited me and Ruby here to talk about our work, uh, and who brought the good luck that my book actually came out <laughs> when I arrived here. Um, they saw it before I did. The book was sent to, to Stephanie, to whom also I should extend thanks for everything that she's been doing. I want to thank the students um, who've invited us here, invited me here, um, and uh, told us about their research projects and um, helped make this trip, even the short time we have here, so uh, pleasant and so uh, uh, rewarding. So thank you all for that. Um, as Ashtosh has told you, what I'm presenting to you is out of, and it is like Ruby's talk yesterday, uh, it is the first time I'm talking out of this book. Um, it's a new book called The History of Prejudice, which um, developed out of work I was doing um, on uh, the Dalits, ex-untouchable groups in India, formerly called untouchables, groups called untouchables, um, the lowest of the low castes, outcasts uh, in, in, a, um, in a traditional um, understanding, um, and African Americans. And out of their struggles for civil rights, citizenship, what have you, which uh, both, in both instances, were promised to them a long time ago and which have been denied or uh, postponed in various ways and on various grounds in both India and the United States. Um, I was just saying to Ashutosh and Michael and some other friends that I realized <coughs> a few years after we'd moved to Johns Hopkins that I actually lived in this country and that I wasn't just visiting the country as I had done several times before. And at that point, I decided that it was important for me to engage with the history and politics of the people around me as much as I engaged with the history and politics of the people I'd grown up amongst, you know, 9,000, 10,000 miles away. Uh, and that it wasn't good enough for us to be making the revolution there. It was important to be making the revolution here, or at least in trying to understand the people who had been trying to make the revolution here. And so this book comes out of that. Uh, um, initiative, that, that impulse in my mind uh, to engage with, with uh, the history and politics of my surroundings here. We had grown up in the 60s and 70s hear, hearing about black power. We had grown up hearing about the great struggles in, from Paris and London and Oxford 1968 to women's liberation to black power to the anti-Vietnam struggle. These were all parts of our struggle as well. And so I'd read a fair bit of African-American literature, autobiographical writing, and so on uh, when I was a student in Delhi and through the years after that. Um, and so because I'd been working on Dalits, a stigmatized population in India who had full citizenship rights from the time of, the Indian, of Indian independence and the constitution that was framed in 1950, uh, a stigmatized popula population that was denied in some ways, uh, in many, many ways, its rights as citizens, right? And denied the opportunities which were formally granted to it, or moving up in the world, of uh, living the American dream, living the Indian dream in, this, in the, that particular instance. Um, that stigmatized population seemed in many ways and had been, uh, that stigmatized population itself had invoked the African-American population and its struggles as a parallel, as something that was like our struggle. So it seemed logical in some ways to work with both of those. Anyway, I won't go through the long history of how I came to write this particular book and why it, why it came to be called A History of Prejudice. It does a number of things apart from the juxtaposition of African-American and Dalit struggles and those uh, uh, stories. Apart from that juxtaposition, which is a little unusual, it does one or two things which I think are somewhat unusual, and I want to focus on those here today. For one thing, uh, as a history of prejudice, what I try to do in this book, or at least came to do by the, by the end of the, uh, the writing of the book, was to try and turn the lens onto ourselves, to think about the prejudices that we all live with in some senses. Because the classic thing about prejudice, of course, is everybody else is prejudiced, we are not. Prejudice is what others have. It's their 
unjustified beliefs. We never have unjustified beliefs. Our beliefs are always justified. And so what I do in the book is begin with a rough and ready distinction between what I call a vernacular prejudice, which, which I call vernacular because it is visible at certain times. It is visible, certainly, at times of polarized political contest, in times of great struggle, anti-racism, anti-casteism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At those sorts of times, there is the visibility of caste prejudice, race prejudice. There is a discourse around it. There is some understanding of prejudices that a state and a society needs to address, needs to control in some ways, contain in some ways, measure if possible and uh, ameliorate to the extent that that is possible. But underlying that, and beyond it, I wanted to suggest, and I do suggest in the book, there is what I've called a universal prejudice. What is passed off as common sense, as what we live with, which is very rarely, I mean, all prejudice is rarely acknowledged, especially by those who are prejudiced. But the universal prejudice is the common sense of the modern, is the common sense of our times. To be modern is to be certain kinds of things, to live in certain kinds of ways, to speak in certain kinds of ways. So that there is a grammar of the modern individual, a grammar of modern life, which really, quite literally, means speaking and writing in particular kinds of ways, thinking in particular kinds of ways. It even extends, as we all know, to dressing in particular kinds of ways. It extends to eating in particular kinds of ways, uh, even though we might make the odd exception and allow chopsticks as you know, culturally interesting. So that's OK. But fundamentally, being modern requires the use of soap and toothbrushes and so on and so forth. There's a certain grammar written into it. It requires a rational order, which I will put to you if one wants to uh, summarize it. It is law and order, a rational order, which is a de an agentive reason living this, the society and state and, and norms of a law and order society in a particular way. So it, it, it has that. It has, along with that, I think, notions of the modern citizen, the universal citizen, who is the same everywhere, however differently they might dress, that citizen is a citizen, I'm going to make some argument about this, a citizen without a body that counts. In some senses, there's a kind of inner soul or mind, and that expresses itself in the same way everywhere, whatever its external articulations. So I'm going to talk, to some extent, about this universal prejudice, which I want to translate. The simplest way of translating it is to say it is the common sense of the modern of what we believe is axiomatically true. And I believe, I suggest in, in the book uh, quite strongly, that it shores up what we understand as prejudice. It shores up the vernacular. It actually is the, is the ground upon which the vernacular prejudices are built, because vernacular prejudices come to be justified or come to be understood, ex, ex, what is the word? Um, excused on the grounds that this is how we have to be, right? So for the time being, these kinds of restrictions are required. So colonial societies need to be colonized in order to be brought into the world of the modern, in to, be, uh, to be made modern, even if the language for this changes. And now it's quite often called spreading democracy in the world, right? Finding the right, the, the same things, modern, voting, is modern. It doesn't really matter what else accompanies the vote, but to have the vote is somehow modern. Democracy is reduced to that particular proposition. There's all sorts of ways in which we could uh, talk about this. But, and I, I, perhaps I should uh, give you one farcical example, which many of you will know, which will work. I gave you the farcical example of how we dress and how we eat, which is part of how, what it is uh, to be modern in, in many, many eyes. Samuel Huntington, many of you will know as distinguished political scientist, writes in the book, Who Are We?, which Ruby and I have written about in um, various little political commentaries. He writes in the book, Who Are We?, about Hispanics, about migrants into this country from across the, the border in the south, um, and the difficulty of their ever becoming Americans, true Americans, 
On what grounds? On the grounds, and these are his words, that they do not dream in English. Now that's as farcical as it can get, that they do not dream in English. I mean, one could really have, one would have to unpack this in all sorts of interesting ways to think, what do we dream in? What, do, what are images like and so on and so forth? But the idea not only that they do not speak English or do not know English well enough, they do not read the um, American Constitution and so on, that's far away. They do not dream in English so they cannot be real citizens of, of this country. And I, I suggest to you that Something underlying all of this, or something that underlies all of this, is the kind of sense that English is somehow modern. And in countries like India, and I'm sure it applies in many other parts of the world, in countries all, all over South Asia certainly, to be able to speak English, to perform in English, is to be modern already, which is an extraordinary, extraordinary um, distorted uh, understanding of what is democratic in Indian society, for example. I mean, you know, one could open that up in all sorts of ways. You know, you will have guessed from, from the fact that I've just been waffling for so far that I can waffle a very long time. So what I'd like is if you wouldn't mind telling me 10 minutes before you want me to stop. Uh, I can speak for about 40 minutes altogether. So, okay. But about 10 minutes before that time, just tell me that we're, we're getting to the time when I will have to be cut off. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and illustrate the propositions I'm making about a common, unstated, universal prejudice uh, with three, three sorts of examples, um, with an escalating level of difficulty in persuading you that this is, um, I, I imagine, in maybe everybody will be persuaded and say this is banal, you know, this is obvious. But I think some of it's very obvious, some of it's less so. And I'm going to try and put, put to you three different arenas in which we can think about common unstated prejudice. Um, the first of them comes with something that we all work with as social scientists and, and uh, people working in the humanities and as concerned citizens, the idea of difference. And I'm going to use the idea of difference, which is the deployment of the proposition that people don't belong to the mainstream, uh, in some senses, not quite right. They don't quite belong. They need to, they need to uh, accommodate themselves. They are, this, is, this applies to minorities. It applies to marg marginal groups of all, all kinds. It applies to people who are described as deviants, sexual minorities, for example, for a very long time. Um, they need to conform to particular standards, OK? So the deployment of the idea of difference is one illustration for me, and I hope uh, it would be for you, of how a common sense prejudice, a common sense actually uh, inhabits or, or informs much of our understanding of political uh, formations. So I, it's probably best to, for me to read you a paragraph because it's quite well written, this particular one in, in the book. Some paragraphs are not, this one's not so bad. So I say, consider the workings of the idea of difference in our times. Men are not described as different. It is women who are. There is a difference, but men are not described as different. Women are. Foreign colonizers are not different. The colonized are. In their own country, the colonized are different. Caste Hindus are not different in India. It is Muslims and tribals, as they are called, and Dalits, or ex-untouchables, who are. White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, heterosexual males, I've expanded the WASP category, as we all would. White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, heterosexual males are not different in the United States. At one time or another, everybody else is. White Australians are not different. Vietnamese boat people are, and Fijian migrants to Australia are, and astonishingly, Australian aboriginals, the people who've lived in that uh, country for millennia, they are. So difference, just in the way in which we deploy the idea, what is categorized as difference, is, a, to my mind, a quite remarkable example of the kind of universal prejudice we all work with at some level. How do we have to negotiate until, until, until we actually come up, become aware of it? We will continue to talk about these other groups as different, because the mainstream kind of constitutes itself as the norm, as the mainstream. 
Um, I'm going to move from that to something that, again, is very commonly uh, uh, discussed, written about from the 19th century on to today, uh, which I will, it is a fable of the modern, the fable of rags to riches, the fable of, I should call it the fable of the middle class, that anyone can be middle class, and middle class not in the working class sense in which American politicians now use that term, but in the sense of independent, autonomous, not with inherited wealth, but not working with hands, not, working with, not doing physical labor. Middle class in that sense of independent professional sorts of groups, uh, comfortable in their circumstances, able to build their own lives as they wish. Anyone can be middle class, and to some extent, everyone should be middle class. That's the, the promise of the modern and the condition of the modern. Um, and yet, we all know this, so we should just stop. This is, this is a fable that, of course, 19th century England had it, had in full, America had it, you know, rags to riches, even precedents came, from, came that way. And India had it um, in, the, in the early 20th century quite strongly. Um, even though alongside it, at least for a, for a certain time, there was a certain kind of uh, disdain, a pejorative um, view of those who were making it now. They were not aristocrats. They were not the old rich. They were not really, they were not really it. But nonetheless, they came, not only to be the norm, they came in, in time to be the desired end. This is what all societies should be. This is where they should go. And everyone can get there. And yet we all know that laboring peoples could not get there very easily. Non-whites could not get there very easily. Uh, the third world in general could not get there very easily. What you got was in um, Britain, for example, Catholics, Jews, and Irish excluded from the middle classes for a very long time. You got Jews, Italians, or Irish in North America excluded from it for a very long time. You get to this day in North America, or uh, in the United States, Native Americans and African Americans and other immigrant recent uh, immigrant groups denied that place as automatically as, um, what shall I say, um, comfortably middle class. They are not people who fit there. How did they get there is the question. Where did you get this car? You know, how do, whose house is that? Where did you get this passport? You know, all kinds of questions can be asked. Uh, and Dalits in India, ex-untouchable groups, lower caste groups of many, many kinds, sometimes Muslims too, especially poorer Muslims, uh, are up against the same kind of prejudice, the same kind of understanding, well, you know, how could you be here? And I'll illustrate this uh, is, uh, a little more. The, the point that we need to make or bear in mind, and again, everybody knows this, so this is not the, something I need to uh, labor, uh, but the point I think we need to bear in mind is that the promise of the modern is accompanied by a great deal of destruction, that the promise and the possibilities of the modern come with the destruction of many kinds of lifestyles, come with the establishment of inequalities of great resources, come with the establishment of slums. Slums are not pre-modern. Slums are not, you know, a relic of something that used to exist before. Garbage and dust and slums in the cities are very much a product of the modern. And so what it produces is these deep and marked inequalities. People who are denied from the very conditions of their life and from the conditions of their birth, the possibilities, the, the chance of easily making the American dream, of easily living the American dream or the Indian dream as maybe. So we need to uh, sort of bear in mind the destruction and the alienation that comes with the great potential and possibilities and opening up of opportunities that modern industrialization, commercial expansion, globalization, you know, whatever stage you want to take it, all, all of this uh, takes. Uh, it leads for a very long time, as those of us who grew up in the African or Asian colonies will know, it leads for a very long time to the denial of the possibility of the modern in ma many of those parts of the world, and of great struggles to overcome that denial. The great struggles in which, of course, the contradiction is going to be that those who are struggling reproduce the same arguments about what it is to be modern, right? So that they wish to join the same uh, complex, cultural and economic and political complex, democracy, as I said a while ago, 
might become the sign of the modern. Capitalism of a certain kind becomes the sign of the modern. Industry of a certain kind becomes the sign of the modern. And, and you may well say, well, it's not a particularly modern society. There are no factories there. And you have to think to yourself, well, I mean, you know, that, that may be the least troubling thing about Providence, Rhode Island today, that there are no factories here. It may be the nicest thing that's happened to Providence, Rhode Island in, in recent times. But anyway, that's the, the next level at which I wanted to pitch that. The last one is one um, that, once again, I suspect that in this audience, I probably do not need to, can I just take the water? <coughs> Um, I won't need to labor the point, but it's one that we don't attend to uh, as closely, certainly, but as often as perhaps we need to. And that is the common sense of the universal subject citizen agent that I mentioned right at the beginning, whose body does not matter. The body of this agent of this citizen is simply a container or a vehicle. It's no more. That's the understanding of the modern. It happens to be. It's an accident. It's something you'll overcome because there's something more. There are inherent abilities, mental and psychological, perhaps cultural, whatever, that we might all have. And yet, in a very peculiar way, it seems to me, that the body of the citizen and the body of the modern human being has been divi divided at least into two categories, one of, in one of which it is very clear that the body matters enormously. And I'm going to just use this. This is crude. I'm going to suggest that there is the criminal body and there is, what shall we say, the law-abiding, the citizenly body. Okay? And in the criminal body, though, as I say to you, we do not always attend to this enough, in the criminal body, the body matters from the start. So that there is a suspicion of the subordinated and the marginalized riding in a car. Right? The number of people, African American colleagues will tell you this, but there's a lot of writing about this now, about the number of African Americans or Dalits in India or others who can be marked out as somehow not quite right who are stopped and asked, where did you get this car? Why are you in this car? How did you buy this car? I have a colleague, a very distinguished anthropologist, who was born in Saudi Arabia, is British, and is an aristocratic British gentleman, <laughs> quintessential in virtually every, you know, in his presentation. He lives in New York now, he teaches in New York, and he's been coming back to the United States for 30 years or, or longer. He says that any number of times when he comes back into the United States, he has a British passport, dual citizenship. They ask him, where did you get this passport? Not because of his accent, not because of his demeanor, but because he was born in Saudi Arabia. It's a marked body in, in all sorts of ways. And it's no accident that African-American colleagues and, and activists have said, that there's not only driving under the influence or driving while intoxicated, there is also driving while black, right? Or that Native Americans have said driving under the influence is also uh, <laughs> is accompanied by driving while Indian. All, now, this becomes lighthearted at some level for others. It's not so lighthearted for those driving in those cars. There is a body that is marked. I want to take it just a couple of steps further and, and, and think about this. Skip Gates, uh, Henry Lewis Gates, trying to return. All of you know this story. Trying to go into his own house on a return from China in Cambridge. Almost arrested, certainly accosted, for trying to enter his own house. Why? Because there are two black men trying to enter a house in a, in a really, you know, kind of upper class or upper middle class neighborhood. Forrest Whitaker, just last week, in an upscale Delhi in, in New York, near Columbia University, being stopped and frisked. It's a well-known actor. He's, so the body matters. The, in the criminal body, this is marked as a criminal body, straight away. Or the treatment of this country's first black president. I, I don't have to go over all of this, but it, it's just worth remi reminding ourselves, because we, how many white presidents have been told, you lie, Mr. President? How many white presidents have been asked, have been called, 
Imam Hussein, Barack, Barack Hussein, uh, Obama. How many have gone through a birthing controversy? This happens because he's a black president. For all his distinction, for all his um, civility, for all his uh, extraordinary aristocratic demeanor, right? I mean, there's just all sorts of things. In the Indian case, the parallel case is we have now ex untouchable Dalit chief ministers in many provinces, Dalit political leaders of many kinds, and we have a constant, constant barrage and discourse in the media, in political discussions everywhere about their corruption. These people are utterly corrupt. Look at this Dalit woman chief minister, how much money she... Do you don't say this about all those other amazingly corrupt chief ministers and political leaders we have, because we've had them all the time. And we have them here, right? They go, they go to war in other, in other countries, right? But you do not have this massive discourse of corruption around them. That is attached to a particular body. And there are terms in North Indian languages which uh, signify that a particular caste is automatically the caste of a thief, right? The caste of people who will plunder, who will loot uh, the property of others. This is written into the language. It is part of what people grow up with. And we continue to live with it in a discourse that people like us produce in the media, on television, in, 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 in classes, and certainly in uh, discussions in our homes, of the corruption of these lower class politicians or lower caste politicians. That are coming up. And I could go on multiply, multiplying this um, uh, many times over. Let me give you an example of something that I collected notes on when I was back in India last month, which is not in the book. But the others, many of the examples I've given are in this book. But here's an example of the criminalized body, which is not in the book. A body that comes to view around the question of rape, which has become a very important question uh, in, in, in the national uh, debate <coughs> just since last December because of incidents in Delhi. And comments on rape um, in India, as, as elsewhere, by the defenders of the traditional order actually fall remarkably into this, I mean, tell us something quite remarkable about the understanding of the body and of certain bodies. Other bodies don't seem to matter. These bodies do. Okay? Rape is a problem, we are told by the defenders of the traditional order in India. And repeatedly this has been said. Rape is a problem, I'll have to say this in the Hindi and then well, partly Hindi. Rape is a problem of India, not Bharat. The Hindu right wing particularly makes this distinction between an India that is modern, westernized, you know, big city, what have you, and Bharat, which is the Hindi or Sanskrit uh, version of the name for India that's written into the Indian constitution. Bharat is supposed to be the traditional India that lives on in the villages, that's more conservative, where the family still counts more, which is not individualistic and not westernized. So rape, we are told, is a problem of India not of Bharat, and you go say that to, uh, to women in, in the villages or women in forest uh, districts where they have been raped and exploited and, uh, and murdered for, for uh, generations, uh, it, it, would, it would make no sense, but that's the first move. The second very general proposition is, it is the handiwork of migrants to the cities. It's the handiwork of single male young migrants who are deracinated, who are lost in these new cities which are too big, which are too westernized, where they are bombarded with advertisements from the western media, where western cultural stereotypes take over. These people, that's a particular body once again, these people don't know how to handle it. They don't know how, what to do. And the consequence is this distorted sexual drive, this distorted um, sexual exploitation. But finally, and most importantly, and all of us would be, uh, will be aware of this from other contexts as well, most crit critically, it's a problem of women being immodestly dressed. It's women being inadequately covered. It's women being in places where they should not be. And so women should not be out on public transport. They shouldn't be in buses. They shouldn't be in taxis even. They shouldn't be on the streets. 
They should certainly not be out at night. They should be in the kitchen. They should be at home where they have always been. You know, that's, that's the discourse. And it's an extraordinary discourse in a globalizing India. Colossal growth, huh? Um, uh, growth rates. This, this is going to be one of the great new shining, shining countries of the world. Um, in this globalizing India, the service industry, these call centers, have become one of the big, big employers. And those service, those call centers, as all of you will know if you've called, you know, Delta Airlines or you know various other places, those call centers are working late at night in uh, in Delhi or in Mumbai or in Bangalore because they're servicing people here in the West. So late at night counts. These, these women have to work in the call centers late at night, but they should not be in public transport, they should not be in taxis, they should not be on the streets, they should not be out at night. And that's, that's a colossal, um, you know, a contradiction that you, you cannot handle. It goes to the extent, and this is the final thing, there is, there is a, uh, a head priest of a major temple in Madurai um, who, who has who said in the course of an interview that Hindu women are bringing this upon themselves. It's their own fault. What they should be doing is wearing burqas like Muslim women. This is a Hindu right wing now telling us that Hindu women really ought to be wearing burqas. Precious, given that the Hindu right wing has spent all of its time in the last 30 years lambasting Muslim society for the way it treats its women and for and for, for everything else that Muslims do as Muslims. Now there's a proposition that, that you should wear burqas. Now I've given you all of this background because what I do in the book, and I'm going to, uh, I, I'm going to try and conclude with this, the, these last examples. What I do in the book, um, I, thought, I thought for a long time about whether I would try and bring you African American examples or examples of the civil rights struggle in the, in the two countries. Uh, or speak about autobiographies from Dalits. And I decided I would do the last because I thought my audience was going to be primarily a South Asianist one. I thought, too, that one of the exchanges said something about caste and the urban order as being part of the rubric under which I was supposed to come and speak. Anyhow, so one of the chapters in my book is built on an African woman, uh, African American woman's uh, autobiography. I'm not going to talk about that today. There is another chapter which is built around the autobiographies of many Dalit uh, intellectuals, thinkers, uh, m m uh, professionals, and builds particularly on the autobiographies of two families, one a woman's and one a man's. And I will just tell you a little bit about both, but I will focus on the man's autobiography because of what it tells us about the, what should we say, the common sense assumptions of the modern and the rags to riches tale that I've been trying to talk about. The women's story, the women's autobiography, Jina Amsa, written in Marathi by a Marathi, uh, by a uh, woman in a small town in, in Maharashtra uh, called Baby Kondiba Kamle, that's her name. Baby Kamle wrote this, wrote this book um, in, uh, in, in the 1990s. I, I won't go into the details of it. The point I want to make about this book is this. It's written in the, in the uh, context of the great Dalit struggle for citizenship, for equal rights, for civil rights, uh, and for political power, which in many parts of the country um, they have now gained some access to and some, some um, uh, ability to contest. Um, in that context, it's an autobiographical account, which is primarily an autobiographical account about the awakening of the Dalit masses, brought about by the great political leader B. R. Ambedkar, and this is this is the form in which it's told. It's it's a great hagiography almost. It's a great story about our great leader and his liberating of our consciousness and us, and of his enabling this movement. I mention this because the story is told and is, uh, is built around this struggle of the Dalits against the upper castes, of the lower castes against the upper castes, and of the need to make a, an Indian democracy, a democratic order, where everyone has equal rights. It's built that way, it's very powerful, beautifully articulated. The Dalit, the ex-untouchable groups, laborers in the main, are the protagonists, are the heart of this story, are the heroes of this story. But Baby Kamble 
writes in detail about her village, her uh, in-laws' home, her own husband's home, and so on and so forth. And in writing about that, she ends up, ends up is wrong. Okay. Um, she writes at great uh, length about the way women were treated in the community, about how little girls were married off. And those little girls from the age of 11 or 12 or 13 onwards were treated extremely badly in the Mahar community, in this Dalit community, whose civil rights struggle she's talking about. But the women's struggle or the women's question never becomes centered in her analysis. So of the two bodies that are absolutely central to her story, one body does not figure in her writing, as it were. It's there. All of it's there. But it's not what the writing is about. It's not what the narrative builds. The narrative is that of lower caste against upper caste, lower classes against upper classes, of the need to build an equal society. It's a narrative in which the story of these women and their struggles disappears, more or less. She, she wrote this autobiography in hiding from her husband. For 20 years, she was writing without anyone in the family except one brother knowing that she was writing. And it was only when bits of it got to be published in some magazines that they realized she was writing this thing. And when the translator of her autobiography, a colleague of mine in Hyderabad, said to her, but Baby Thai, why didn't you write about all of this, the fact that you had to write it in hiding? Why didn't you write about all of this in the autobiography? And she says, but I didn't want to give a bad name to my husband. He was my husband, after all. And then she says, she, she says in the course of this interview, women were treated like footwear by the men. She, those are her, her words. And, uh, but how can you write about it when it is the experience of everybody? And so there is, in her own narrative, in her own understanding at that particular time, a certain political struggle, a certain solidarity, a certain um, uh, understanding which allows one narrative and absolutely denies the possibility of the other. But the one I really want to, 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 to talk about, uh, finally, since I've been told now I have about seven minutes left, uh, is Narendra Jadav and his family. There's a memoir called Antabap Anyami, also written in Maharashtra by a, a family that's now in Bombay that originates from a um, uh, district not far from there, 200, 300 miles from there. And the, the parents, of Narendra Jadav. Uh, he was an agricultural laborer, uh, Damodar Jadav, migrated to Bombay, worked in the railway lines, the, 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 the docks, the railway that serviced the docks, worked in that right through the 20s and 30s, into the 50s and 60s, when his children became educated enough uh, to go into, into to competitions for um, civil service positions, government positions. And all the sons uh, actually did extremely well. Um, one of them joined the Indian Foreign Service, the diplomatic service. Um, one of them became the head of the Municipal Council of Bombay in the, in the end. The youngest son, Narendra Jadav, who actually produces this memoir, became vice chancellor of Pune University, one of the most distinguished universities in Western India. He's a very distinguished economist. He's a powerful intellectual uh, and, and a good friend. Uh, his daughter was a student of ours in Johns Hopkins and then a student of ours at Emory University. Uh, and in fact, that's how we first met him. But I tell the story because there's a story of three generations that, they, that, they, that comes out in this memoir. The first generation, the story of the father, which is available only in Marathi notebooks, uh, written in the dialect, the district dialect that the father understood, which Narendra Jadav kindly gave to me and which I got help with to translate and understand. The, that story is very much the story of working class people in the countryside and in Bombay. The solidarity of working class people, the lives of working class people who lived with the animals, who lived with the en environment, who made their world out of everything that was available to them, the little things. And the environment is a very large part of that story. But to the extent that there is a politics in it, it is the politics of a burgeoning working class struggle. Very much. This was the uh, Bombay of the 19, late 1920s and 30s. By the time the same notebooks becomes the core of the Marathi publication, this was written by Narendra Jadav and first broadcast on the radio in the early 1990s in, in, in um, Pune and Bombay. 
And when it was broadcast, it became a bestseller in no time. There was a demand that it be printed, and the printed version sold out within five days, the first edition. And it has now run into six or seven editions, all of which have different kinds of stories. And there are English, there's an English transcreation, which is like a novel of the three generations of this thing. There are, there's a French translation, there's a Japanese translation, you name it, all sorts of things have happened. The extraordinary thing is that where is in the grandfather's no notebooks, what you have is the story of a community and of working class people making do, struggling, living with dignity, of able to survive and able to survive with self-respect, able to make moves that were hard, but that, that they still made those choices. What you get in the story of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the, this, in the Marathi published version, that is the story written by Narendra Jadav and his siblings, is a very different, an emotional family saga in which the story is very much that of powerful individuals, the father particularly, and these sons, and what they're able to attain. And I just want to refer to some of that in, this, uh, in, in these last uh, couple of minutes that I, uh, that I will talk. Um, the narrative now is that about the ability of the extraordinary individual to break all bounds. And the extraordinary individual in the Marathi version, which is actually uh, dedicated to Baba Sahib Ambedkar, the leader of the Dalit movement, B.R. Ambedkar. The, the extraordinary individual is Baba Sahib Ambedkar and our father, my father, that is Narayan Jadav's father, Damodar Jadav. So it becomes the two fathers, in some senses, of the community who can do it. Uh, let me just um, read these three paragraphs, four paragraphs, and uh, stop there. The family story is now constructed by Narendra Jadav around an unusual and unusually rewarding father-son relationship. Um, after a uh, comment on the straightforward and caustic language that, Damo, uh, that the father Damodar favored, um, the chapter goes straight into discussion of his character. All of us brothers and sisters called him Dada, elder brother. Presumably, they were following the address of some elders who called him Dada. Medium height, now he's describing the father. Medium height, dark, asymmetrical face, stern manner, but with a mischievous look in his eyes when talking to little children. Dhoti, the loincloth, white skirt, khaki coat, and black hat. This was his regular dress, a staff in his hand. Only the staff was used less for support than to intimidate others. OK, so he's building it. We were six brothers, uh, sisters and brothers, uh, brothers and sisters and all. Our childhood was spent in Vardala, one of the uh, working class uh, slum areas in, in uh, western Bombay, uh, in um, northern Bombay. Given the economic, social, and cultural circumstances in which we grew up, the other boys and girls of the locality fared as one might expect. They all suffered. They, they all still working class people, struggling. The sole difference between them and us was this, that we had Dada with us. We had a father. Dada's self-confidence was extraordinary. Kupats dan, danga. Get me a long enough stick, I'll flatten this circular earth and show you. So he, he would announce like an Archimedes. Uh, he uses the Archimedes in, in the Marathi version. Dada was a believer in rational thought and the individual's effort and intolerant of any kind of blind, blind faith. The father from the little hamlet of Ozar, which is where they came from, involved with the nitty gritty of everyday struggle for existence, is, according to the author, eternal because he is not an individual but a striving force. So the individual has become something transcendent, even, even bigger. And in this particular version, it really, what you require is no more than the struggle. This urge, this willingness to strive beyond human. Uh, ability in some ways, beyond what you think you are capable of. And if you have that possibility, you can overcome. You know, anyone can. The, uh, and th there's a lovely, and this is the last uh, thing I'll, uh, I'll say to you, there's a lovely uh, little postscript that Narayan Jadav gets his daughter, the one who was our student uh, in, in Hopkins and uh, Emory to write. Um, 
uh, and the first script is published in the English transcription first because she wrote it in English, and then hyped up even further in, an, in a Marathi version where it appears in the sixth or seventh edition of the Marathi book. And she says, you know, I was 16 years old. What did he expect me to write? Yeah. Right. 16 years old, he, she says, because she spent a lot of her time schooling as well as college in the United States. In the US, she says, no one reminds me that I am Dalit. I mean, that's who I am. Take it or leave it. When I hear about people deliberately marrying into their own caste or su subcaste, it bothers me. Recently, she said about the Gujarat um, uh, earthquake. I, heard, I was appalled to learn that relief in the earthquake-stricken area in Gujarat was being distributed on a caste basis. Now I can see why my dad talks about Dalit stuff. But I, I think I'm a Purva, that's her name. I'm not tied down by race, religion, or caste. My ancestors carried the burden of being a Dalit and bowing down, bowing down to demeaning tasks, even after India's independence. I have the torch they have lit for me, and nothing can stop me. And so here's her fin final statement. I am a Purva, just a Purva, a global citizen without any caste or religious label, a global citizen with Indian roots. Now, no one tells me that I am a Dalit. She comes from an extremely well-to-do family. They're extremely well off. They live in a wonderful part of Bombay when, when they're there. Uh, so she's right. No one tells me I am a Dalit. I couldn't care less if anyone suggested that I might be handicapped in some way because of my caste background. They have a problem. They need psychiatric, psychiatric treatment. This is all in, written in the English in the Marathi script in the version of the book. I stand on the shoulders of what they've done uh, before me. Believing in a religion of hu humanity, I am a global citizen of Indian roots. Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar has handed on to me a blazing torch. With that, I will clean up everything all around. I will make my own future. No one can stop me. And the point I want to make is, here, Narendra Jadav and his daughter, and I think large numbers of the, the very successful from, from uh, the, even the Dalit backgrounds, produce a narrative which is the same narrative of rags to riches and the possibility of it for all, even against the evidence of everything their parents lived through, everything that many of this, their siblings and many of the people that they know extremely closely are still living through. In spite of that, the, the, the discourse of the modern, the possibility that we all can do it, the American dream is available to all, comes through in this kind of narrative. I'll stop there. Thank you. Our first commentator is Sherry uh, Augusto. Uh, she's a Watson Fellow and a general associate professor of public policy at the Topman Center here at Brown, an honorary research associate at the Center for African Studies University of Cape Town, and also an associate fellow at the Center for Caribbean Thought, University of the West Indies. In Brazil, Jiri is a part of a project team led by uh, I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, Bahayas or Bahayas Steve Biko Cultural Institute. She's also engaged with the Afro-Brazilian scholars who are working with the Secretariat for the promotion of racial equality in the Brazilian presidency. She is one of the principal organizers of the New Works Working Group of the Student Nonviolent Coordination Committee Legacy Project with a particular interest in civil rights movement of the 1960s. From 73 to 1991, she worked in Southern Africa. And before coming to Brown, she taught at the Kennedy School of Harvard from 1994 to My chair will kill me. I have to say I'm at Africana Studies now. <laughs> My chair will kill me. Africana Studies. I'm not at the Taubman Center anymore. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. I I'm still associated it. with him. But he would, he would kill me. Okay, it's all right. So uh, comparative studies of anti-black racism are not new, though there's still much work to be done in that field. But Professor Pandey's new book, A History of Prejudice, Race, Caste, and Difference in India and the United States, provides us with a rich foray onto terrain less traveled. 
He is exploring, as one of the blurbs says, multiple dimensions of prejudice in two democracies, India and the United States. The surge, or maybe it's just a trickle and I'd like it to be a surge, of scholarship and even documentary films in this direction is much welcome and long overdue. In particular, I'm glad to discuss a book, and I'll, my comments are on the book rather than on the talk, a book it, which probes the historical and personal experiences of Dalits and African Americans whose everyday lives are grappling with imposed, enforced hierarchies of difference on multiple levels. Still, I accepted with some reluctance this invitation, an invitation to comment on a new work by a preeminent historian of the Subaltern School. That is not my field. But two things made me accept the invitation. Where's Palomi? The invitation that she insisted on. Uh, one is an experience from a few years back, and the other I knew would be occurring just before I came to this session and as part of my own heritage of black freedom struggles. A few years back when a colleague of mine and, and I began something called the Biari Critical Global Humanities Institutes, our first intake in that first year was fortunate to include five or six Indian participants. Now there was no way for us to know when we selected them, but half of them were Dalits and half of them were from upper caste, various, but upper caste. The dynamics which played out among them here at Brown, almost subconsciously on their part, eventually led to a rap session among all the participants, and they're, they're young scholars who come from all over the global south, in which one of the brightest of the young scholars, herself upper caste Indian, quite admittedly from a very privileged background, and very radical in her ideas, including subaltern history, had to admit that the experiences of Biari, 1,000 miles from home, pushed her to an understanding of the subtler workings of caste discrimination that nothing in her past education or life had forced her to do. I often think, as all of us continue to correspond with each other, about the things that working with critical global humanities has taught me about how caste and gender conjugated together function in India. And those sessions also first introduced me to the name and works of Ambedkar, and I'll say more about it in a minute. The other experience which pushed me to accept seemed almost too coincidental to be true. I'm just coming last weekend from a, this past week from a long working session in southwest Georgia involving pr several projects of community education, social justice work, organizing black farmers around questions of land loss and recovery, and organizing women around multiple issues all embedded deeply in a long, long struggle for freedom and justice waged by local people in those rural counties and small towns. That work with the SNCC Legacy Project and the Southwest Georgia Project for Community Education in the counties surrounding Albany, Georgia, occurred in a place very much like where Viola Andrews, who is Professor Pandey's chief informant for one of the chapters, grew up. And some of the participants were even of Viola's generation, so you know these were elderly ladies. Sometimes it's good to ground the things that we're reading about and thinking about. I'll limit my observations so then in that case to just two chapters of the book, because I read it in parts. The book itself just came out. Chapters five and six, where Professor Pandey pushes us to reconsider relocating difference via an African-American biography and rescripting the body via a set of Dalit memoirs. And those are the ones that he focused on most in the talk. Rather than do a close reading of it, any of it, in a few minutes, I'll do what I usually do when I really like a book, and that is I think aloud about what the reading called to my mind. It's just that instead of me talking in the room by myself, I'm going to tell it to you. I found particularly useful the notion that Professor Pandey is working through here, that of subaltern autobiography as history. The project I alluded to, the SNCC Legacy Project, is at this moment trying to work on a similar question, although we don't call it subaltern that of shaping a different historiography of the Southern Freedom Movement, which up here people call a civil rights movement. We're trying to do it by foregrounding not just the actions and experience, but the thinking of local movement veterans themselves. That's different from having academics interpret where activists are the raw material, you listen to their oral history or whatever, and then somebody else interprets what they actually were thinking. So instead of oral histories, we're thinking about how to get those who were at the center of particularly critical moments and the emergence of critical ideas to reflect and interpret those or reinterpret those now and get that published digitally and in print. One of our dilemmas, I think, is one that Professor Pandey is also grappling with and continues to grapple with in his work. Who do we choose, not just to represent, to stand in for others, 
but also to interpret what went on. One always has to choose one's interlocutors in studies like these, who to put in conversation with whom, whom to juxtapose with whom. Professor Pante puts before us in this com the complex, fascinating figure of Viola Andrews. That's in chapter five. I couldn't help wishing that instead of the scholar Zora Neale Hurston, and if I recall, it's Alice Walker, in her chapter, Viola's thoughts might have been put alongside those of people from that same part of the world in walks of life, a kind of inquiry and reflection that comes out of a productive kind of adjacency. The women I was with this weekend in Southwest Georgia have much in common with Viola. They live what she says in her expression, and it's a wonderful expression, which she unpacks and works with throughout the chapter, kind of jumbled lives. Families which lost land, women with sharecropping parents, African-American families who looked to salvation and education, or sometimes education as salvation. Black women whose interiority and exteriority are connected and grounded in a multifaceted struggle, keeping their land or winning it back. They have to deal with economic effects of a ever increasing uh, concentration of capital in the New South, the supposedly New South, the still lingering effects of racial prejudice and inequality on their minds and their bodies, and at the same time trying to think about and construct a different future, sometimes as women alone, sometimes connected to family. I was with these black farmers, and most of them are farmers, Men, women, youngsters, elders, families, in one of those black churches that Professor Pande writes about in the chapter. But the optic was slightly different. Shiloh Baptist, I even brought the paper from the mass meeting. Shiloh Baptist, like so many black churches, was not just a place of solace. It was and is that, and so much more. I wish I could transmit the feeling, the aura, the space. I'll just say what Bernice Reagan, who is a member of our SNCC Legacy Project, but who also grew up as a little girl on a sharecropping farm there, and she's now 70. And she said to me, when we raised a hymn in the church, and they call it raising the hymn, not singing it. When we raised a hymn in the church, we as black radicals were writing a poem to God. When we sang at mass meetings in the church, we were announcing ourselves and our ideas in song. That tradition is still going on in Southwest Georgia. Knowing that, I could read so much more into the role that Buddhism played for Dalits who are rescripting their own bodies, but also in some cases, they're rescripting their communities or perhaps India itself. Professor Pandey's analysis of both Viola Andrews and Baby Camblay and their families raises a persuasive set of arguments and questions about, quote, the confounding of individual experiences with collective condition. I couldn't help but thinking, though, that some of the same issues could be illuminated quite productively from other angles. For example, that of critical race theory and other schools of Africana thought. So when he urges us quite rightly to, quote, give the history of race, caste, and gender prejudices and of their consequences a greater depth and density, I thought of a notion of racism that was foreshadowed many years ago by W.B. Du Bois, which suggests that racism, and one could argue casteism, is, yes, a violent imposition on individual but also collective bodies and psyches, but it's also an ideology of justification, and this is often where religion comes in, and a set of institutional arrangements which constrain, repress, exploit life at every turn. And we have to consider all three at one time, packaged together, and analyze them. I wish that Professor Pande had found space to draw a bit more explicitly, and I could tell from his writing that he's extremely aware and versed in this, but black feminist theory to help us think with Viola about her very complex life. For example, there's this notion of community feminism that Ula Taylor presents in an article, Negro Women as Great Thinkers as Well as Doers, or the theory of triple oppression of black working class women that the transnational feminist theorist and cultural activist Claudia Jones was already arguing in Harlem in 1947 and then in London in the 1950s. Finally, Professor Pandey's book reinforced something I've been thinking about now for some time, ever since that first Biari that I told you about, that, that the long conversation between ideas for social change, which have flowed between India and the Afro-Americas, and I say Afro-Americas because I'm taking in Jamaica, Panama, Brazil, might be more explicitly foregrounded by all of us who consider these matters important. So for example, Shouldn't we surface and analyze more deeply the black radical ideas inherent in Dalit activists taking the name Panthers in the 1970s? Or why not transgress the usual pairing? This is beyond his book, but extending the conversation. Why not transgress the usual pairing Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi? 
with another, Martin Luther King and Bedkar, Martin, uh, Marcus Garvey and Bedkar. The ways in which being an Ambedkarite, and that struck me from the chapter in Dalit memoirs, people would describe themselves as Ambedkarite, in Dalit communities motivated certain kinds of transformations of subjectivities, including a new person with new ideas about what she or he might be able to do, and the conceptualization of alternative citizenships and belongings. This impressed me as having more than a bit in common with being a Garveyite in Harlem or a Garveyite in Alabama or Panama City or Cape Town, and the deep traces in thought and organizing and in personal conduct that this has left in many communities of color. Such comparative research and conversations might also suggest a challenge to the notion that the real life experience of collective self, collective other, leads to the impossibility of a world transforming vision. I think that Robin Kelly, among other radical black historians, points out that the black radical tradition, or even the black reformist tradition, has always been guided, has always been global in its vision, a lens through which many ordinary people in many little small rough places to live in could see how their condition connected to or resonated with that of people elsewhere. To close, I'd like to congratulate most warmly Professor Pandey on this challenge to received accounts of Indian society and history, this effort to read the life stories of African American women in more complex ways, and to encourage more work that contemplates comparatively the Black Freedom Movement and the Dalit Anti-Caste Movement, and the production of thinkers and doers. And for me, coming from the movement myself, I'm a movement child, that's almost never a dichotomous category. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so my comments are going to focus on the book. If you adapt to e-readers, you get to the book a little bit earlier than everyone else. Um, and I want to start by saying it's a completely wonderful book. It's just fantastic because, you know, as I think Jerry was indicating, there are a lot of these kinds of offhand comparisons between the Dalit struggle and the African American struggle. And often people will talk about the Panthers in both cases, or they'll talk about a kind of a generalized sense that racism exists all over the world and there are these various examples that we can run to. But what I think that Professor Pandey does so well is that you've got comparison there without the structure of the example. Um, and especially in alternating the chapters between um, Dalit and African American instances, what really comes across is a kind of national specificity. So for instance, the utility of conversion, um, both concept and rhetoric in the Dalit case or in the question of American nationalism and militarism right, when it comes to African American citizenship. So it's fantastic, and I think you should all read it. So but what I want, I basically got a couple of questions for you that I would love to hear more about. And the, they're around this issue of comparison, in particular temporality. So the book focuses primarily on the 20th century, um, and in particular the late 20th century. And I completely agree with this. Um, with what you lay out is this post-Second World War shift 
Um, that is the moment of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and you've got the, um, the end of a certain kind of acceptable racial hierarchy through, you know, through what happens with Nazism and so forth, which seems to open things up and you know, certain kinds of economic changes. But what's also very clear from the book is that the structure of opportunity and possibility that opens up in both national sites is quite different. Right, so you talk about in the Dalit instance, you might think about partition and the new constitution and the abolition of untouchability. In the African American instance, you um, discuss at length the military service and the ways in which that creates a different kind of discourse around the black body and the potential to be a black citizen. And so my question then is, why choose the same historical moment? Right, because you could have done the kind of book, and some people have done it, where it's, you know, this is the moment of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and here we see it unfolding in America, and Latin America, and India. But what you're doing instead is quite different. And so why not, for instance, do a kind of comparison that takes different historical moments? So the abolition of slavery in the US and the abolition of untouchability in India. And what would we find by putting 1860s here and 1950s there together? Um, or is that something we just feel uncomfortable doing now? Or is that disciplinarily specific? The other question that came to mind related to that as I was reading was the question of other minorities in both instances. So the book, which I hope all of you will get to, you do a really fabulous job of laying out how Dalit oppression and subjugation, especially in post-colonial India, has been by a Hindu majority which defines itself not only in relation to Dalits, but also in relation to Muslims. right? And so one might think in the African-American instance of the ways in which a certain kind of white supremacist discourse requires the mobilization of other racialized minorities, right? So for instance, Asian-Americans produced as a model minority that can then be used to uh, delegitimate African-American claims to citizenship and so forth. And so while I'm absolutely convinced by the kinds of parallels you're drawing, I'm also wondering, for instance, the ways in which I don't think we could compare um, the Asian American and Muslim experience, right? So where does, perhaps we could compare the Latino experience with the Dalit experience. So where does comparison break down and what might one do with questions of internal comparison? When we think about a kind of universal structure of prejudice in each national site that is then differently articulated against different groups. I mean, just thinking back to your comments today and especially around the body which comes across very nicely in what you're talking about, and the notion of the citizen as being able to escape from the body. And in the book, you talk a lot, and I found it very compelling. Um, the body is a kind of archive, as a historical document of oppression, of differentiation. But it seems to me that there's a significant difference there in terms of um, conceptions of embodied difference, right? So in both cases, you have uh, racialized thinking in the sense that there's this conceit of a biologically inherited um, set of inferior traits. But as you discuss, in the African-American instance, there is a discourse around passing. There's a possibility that if one just happens to look white enough, one could appear that way. Um, and in both cases, you have this question of you know, speaking properly and dressing properly. What you were talking about is the modern. But in the Dalit case, and in the instance of Ambedkar and so forth, it's it's much more possible, it seems to me, to pass, if you want to use that word. That if you dress differently and you speak differently and you switch out of your caste, you know, these stigmatized occupations and you change your name, it is really possible. And there is that kind of, there is a certain kind of optional nature there. What seems more intractable in the Indian instance, and I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, so please correct me if I'm wrong, is the stigmatization of professions. Um, so I'm thinking, for instance, in Mulkraj Anand's Untouchable, which is from 1936, and it's both modernist and modernizing, the solution to the problem of untouchability is not Gandhianism, and it's not um, conversion either. It's the flushable toilet, right? Because the problem is not just that one could be born into a, a sweeper caste or a sanitation caste, but that anyone who is stuck cleaning toilets is going to be treated in that way. Um, and I think that's a real problem. It's a real problem here as well, but it's not racialized or biologized in quite the same fashion. And so I thought, too, with what you were talking about, the, um, the fable of the middle class, as you were speaking today, I think that's just fantastic. And I think you're absolutely right that shifting the attention to the, the bourgeoisie and the, the problem of um, acceding to middle class status really opens things up. Because we're quite used to this, this racialized notion of poverty or racialized extravagance, but it's the impossibility of occupying a normal or 
unremarkable relationship to consumption and production. And I wonder, too, if that might open something up in terms of, um, because you talk about these late arriving middle classes, but what about kind of, I was thinking specifically of feminist and anti-homophobic movements, right? Anti-homophobic, LGBT movements, and the ways in which you are talking about the modern, but there's also a, a fashion in which consumption and production in a normal middle class fashion can allow those to become extremely conservative extremely quickly, right? So that difference can be differently um, negotiated as well. But I want to end by going really to a moment in the introduction of the prologue, which I found really moving, where Professor Bande talks about designing these courses, um, I think at Hopkins or was it at Emory? Yeah, which talks about, it. so one compares the black bourgeoisie and the Dalit bourgeoisie, another compares Dalit testimonials and, um, not testimonials, Dalit memoirs with African American memoirs. And finding that um, students of South Asian origin or heritage students wouldn't enroll, right? Um, and I think that's really powerful because what we've got there, if you want to talk about this, the question of universal prejudice, is our students coming in and assuming these things aren't relevant to them, right, and not going in. And I think your book makes a really powerful point for the ways in which the university in this globalizing internationalist moment can look at the question of universalism, right? Not because we want to produce a new universalism which we can beat people up with, but that we could produce, we could excavate this universal prejudice or other conceptions like that. So I'm curious if it seems to me reading it that it's a very powerful argument for more work of this kind that does this sort of comparison, but I'm curious too if you'd be willing to speculate or extrapolate a bit about what implications this has for us as um, not just as scholars but as teachers for curriculum design and for course content. So thank you. And may I also invite a short comment from my colleague, uh, James Marron. Uh, Jim is a, a very distinguished scholar of American politics, and he, it's not that he, he doesn't work simply on contemporary issues, his main work actually on the history of American politics. He has two very well-known books, um, two that I know, they've heard also they're very well-known. One uh, is basically the idea of freedom and democracy in 200 years of American history. That book was called The Frederick Wish. And then a book called Hellfire Nation, which is an examination of the idea of sin in 200 years of American history. And he's thought a great deal about race because there's such an important part of American history in politics. So, Jim? Well, I have not read the book, although I searched on Amazon where they give you an occasional page and I'd read that page and then you jump ahead 20 pages and have to put up with that. But I have to say the project and the lecture is simply exhilarating. You're transcending all kinds of boundaries in very exciting ways. You started talking about clothes and what one wears and I had to chuckle because we, we sit in Pembroke Hall where when it was Pembroke College, women could not have left the dormitory without wearing gloves and hat. Of course, we can't laugh at the women. I noticed there isn't a single man in the room without a tie. Something unimaginable a decade ago and quite rude, uh, uh, really. But things change, and that, of course, is what you're talking about as much as anything else. Let me just make five quick points from the talk about stories, dreams, corruption, rape, and three generations of dreams. So first, it seems to me that in the United States, at least, each liberation movement begins with a redefinition of self. And in a very precise way, black nationalism, to take that example, back to Marcus Garvey and before, um, is taking what's despised and taking what is heaped upon people and embracing it, embracing what they hate, embracing what they despise, celebrating self. That's the story of black nationalism and black power. And to take a less well-known example, Chicanismo is the exact same thing among Latinos. That is, taking a slur in the 1960s and saying, you can call this a slur, but we embrace it and celebrate ourselves. In fact, this kind of idea rewrites American history all the time. There's a, a mural in New York, for example, that showed a um, white man, a, um, a uh, uplifting a former slave. And the mural, once black nationalism embraces a new sense of black self, is taken as racist. 
Slaves freed themselves as much as they were freed, and the idea of the beneficent white is offensive when, it's, when we've reconstructed the category itself. I wonder, I have to ask, whether the Delete Awakening has some of the same reconstruction of self, the same grabbing of exactly what they despise, to throw it back at them. And I ask this because it's a particularly edgy thing now. Modernism tells you, shuck off these identities. Black nationalism, Chicanismo, feminism says, no, no, embrace them. And I wonder how we negotiate that particular challenge now, today, in the United States and in India. Second, I won't go on as long for each of these. Second, I loved the theme through this talk, through this lecture, of dreams. The American dream, the Indian dream, you said in, in quotes. And then you came to Huntington. Uh, they, you, to dream the American dream, you have to dream in English. White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, sexually proper, uh, and so forth. Um, it used to be thought that that dream really meant dream the dream of wealth. But you explode that, and quite nicely, where'd you get this car? Not enough to be rich. That doesn't mean dreaming in English. And if you're going back to the African-American experience in the United States, at the end of World War II, one out of 20 African-Americans, one out of 20 is above the poverty line. One out of 20. 30 years later, it's 15 out of 20. One of the most extraordinary rises to middle class status in the history of the world. Where did you get that car? That doesn't go away. So this extraordinary rise to middle class, to respectability on the standard American dream, doesn't work in this case. The cast of the thief echoes on. And the question, Huntington would say it's dreaming in English, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, but the question still bothers me. Why doesn't it work? Why isn't it enough to rise to middle class status? Well, that's enough for dreaming. Um, Let's say a, another word about the cast of the thief. This has been very powerful in American history. American history has a particular distinction. After the Civil War and the Civil War amendments, African, the former slaves are liberated and given the vote. And then, as far as I know, the only group in history anywhere to have that vote dragged away. And it was quite a enterprising project to give the vote and then take it away. Both were, were difficult things to do, and taking it away as well as giving it. So how did Americans perform this second difficult task of removing the vote from millions of people who had just won it? Well, they called the cast of the thief. It was cries of corruption that did it. You see, for one moment, African Americans moved into the political system in numbers never seen before or since. And it turned out the story that was successful in taking away not only representation, but the vote itself was this vote's story of corruption. These people are corrupt. They'll sell their votes. This, mind you, in the age of Tammany, when the entire American system was based on corruption. And if there's any group that wasn't corrupt, it was the former slaves. But it sounded right, and it worked. Uh, the story still is told, of course. You may know, and you all know, I don't know, I may know, Barack is the food stamp president. What does that mean? Tales of corruption uh, all along. You can't help but notice the great debate about corruption in India today. Of course, corruption on every side, lots of argument. And I wonder if that story reflects the story I've just very briefly summarized in the United States, the calls of corruption as part of the cast of the thief, or whether there's something going on, something else going on in the tales of corruption. And very briefly, you told this very moving story about rape. As you talked about it, I could feel, I don't know if you could feel it, but the whole audience, uh, all of us, were just on edge as you eloquently spoke about, uh, about the, the rape story. But it really brought to mind, to me, the tradition of lynching. The tradition of lynching that says, essentially, if you don't stay in your place, we will kill you. And the tradition of lynching is a tradition that rises each time the promise of progress uh, raises its frightening head. And I wonder if the American tradition of lynching has something to say to the contemporary discussion in India of rape. And finally, a last point. 
this wonderful story of three generations. I look forward to reading it in the book, but I can't help seeing that, hearing that again through Huntington's eyes, Samuel Huntington's eyes, that community of solidarity of the first generation and the community of solidarity, uh, dignity and solidarity in the second uh, generation, that's not talking in English. And the move to wealth that embraces an entire community, that's not dreaming in English. But the move to, for, for, of the extraordinary individual who in modern times cuts him or herself off from the rest of the community and rises on their own merits rather than as part of a group. Now that's dreaming in English. Thank you for a most exhilarating talk. Absolutely wonderful set of comments. I, uh, the book is successful already. <laughs> um, I, I, I said about this book to, to many colleagues that if it fails, it will succeed, because that's the kind of book it is. It asks lots of questions. It, uh, it asks me, uh, it asks my colleagues to tell me what we can do, what one can, you know, what these questions might lead on to. So I want to address just a, a set of issues that, that I think run through. Um, all your comments, and they have to do first with the question of comparative history uh, and comparative work, which those of you, uh, you didn't get those chapters, but I actually spent some time in my introduction bewaring of comparison. I'm, I'm very concerned that we don't set side by side very different experiences and start giving prizes. You know, this one succeeded, Barrington Moore, you know, social origins of dictatorship and democracy, in some senses uh, is the classic example of something that says, you know, this succeeds more, this succeeds less, and, you know, and so on and so forth, and then seeks to find out why. And I'm very wary of that, and what I wanted to do, and I, I struggle to do it in the book, um, there's no, no escape from, from the judgment that this is a work of comparison. I struggle to say it is not a work of comparison, that I am juxtaposing two stories in order to say what juxtaposing those stories will make us ask about each of our stories, the, sto the African-American story and the uh, Dalit story. So I'm going to struggle with that. It will fail, but I would, I would like to live with that concern to try and not do comparative work in that traditional way. I hope this. This might allow us to do comparative work in some other way when it comes. So I'm going to work with that as, as the thread and uh, respond first to Madhumita and then come to Jerry and uh, take up some things that Jim says as well. W why choose the same historical moment? Why not uh, the abolition of slavery and the abolition of unta untouchability? And uh, to my mind, not only because, of course, that would suggest you know, this difference that it happened in the 19th century in America and it's happening in the 20th century in India. That would be part of the problem, I suspect. More than that, I think what I was concerned to do was uh, detail a context that is actually the context for both these struggles. Very, very different. But the post-Second World War context in two liberal democracies that claim great pluralism, tolerance, democratic practice, and claim to be the leaders of the world in this world, produce very different results. They are at very different kinds, or the debates are very different. I want to mark those as very different debates in a context that is shared, in claims that are shared, and leave it at that, and not actually try and bring two moments, chronologically different moments, that may be more similar together. Because I suspect that one would lose too much and one would really be, uh, in some senses, uh, making a judgment about which particular moment was India like America, right? 
And, and it's, it's the last thing. It seems to me that we would want to do, any of us, I suspect uh, you would be with me on that particular one. And so similarly, can we compare Asian Americans and uh, Indian Muslims? Or can we compare Hispanic Americans and Indian Muslims? And I wouldn't want even to ask the question in some senses. I would want to ask the question, how are minorities, because here's an abstraction, how are minorities constituted and treated, and what is the debate around the question of minorities, or the question of min marginalized people, or of subordinated populations? And the question in India and the United States of affirmative action, reservations. These are significant questions asked in those places, and with very different answers, right? But uh, I, I would, I think it would be very difficult. It would probably be inadvisable. It certainly, I wouldn't know how to answer the question to say, are uh, Asian Americans the equivalent of Indian Muslims? Uh, Indian Muslims have lived in India forever, many of them, um, certainly for centuries and centuries. Um, I was, I was in, in Australia uh, in the 1970s and 80s, and we, we drove through 80s. We drove through a town which said, historic Bungandor. 1954, founded 1954. And you know, it gave me a very different sense of the world. It's a very different histories. You don't want to say, okay, what's a historic town? What would be the equivalent of a historic town in India? I wouldn't want to raise that question. Uh, so that's, that's the large question I want to ask. And once again, I think different bodies, because the last thing I'll say about it. Thank you for your comments. And they're, they're actually wonderful. They will help me think all sorts of new things. And the, the point you make about national specificity is the one that I want to emphasize. But I want to emphasize it to carry it one step further by saying national specificity is a little suspect. That the na national itself is an artificial boundary created under particular conditions. So specificity is what we want to be concerned with. And the way in which very different debates and uh, relationships uh, and aspirations are articulated, right, in context that we can spell out most uh, dramatically. These have normally been, uh, for a very long time now, been articulated in national contexts. So it is absolutely right to say that's our starting point. But I think a starting point that we tend to break down, tend to um, uh, erode in some ways if we, if we can. So the last. Uh, thing, uh, um, comment of yours that I would be concerned with and interested in is the question of different bodies and is it not the case that it is much easier for Dalits to pass? But once again I think to myself is this the best question to ask? And my own sense is probably not. I would want to take the step back to think what's the body? that we're concerned with. And, and we're all aware of this. I'm not saying anything particularly uh, novel. But I think the working out of the marked body, the culturally inscribed body that we're concerned with, requires detailing in a very marked, uh, um, significant way. It requires the kind of detail that is rarely given. So the body is clearly not just color, obviously. In any case, there would be all sorts of problems about classification, where you mark boundaries. And that. But it's also not just dress or speech. It's also, and in India, this, this happens very, very quickly. You know, one of the earliest questions people will ask you in, in India when exchanges take place is the question, so where are you from? And this is asked in all sorts of subtle ways. But you know, you keep getting pushed to say what your caste is, what your village is, what occupations your parents or others followed. So where are you from? is leading to that question of what color are you? Yeah? What body is this that I am addressing? Now, so I, I suggest to you that what the body is marked by is, by a, is background, is occupation, is demeanor. How confident are you? How confidently can we walk? And women do not, for a very long time, have not walked with the confidence of men. And that's been their strength. In the end, yes. But nonetheless, the fact that they did not mark, uh, did not walk with strength, marked them out as targets in particular ways. So the body, it seems to me, needs to be um, investigated much more carefully, much more in much greater de detail for its specificity. And I suspect that it would be very hard for one to say it's easier for the Dalit to pass than for the African American. We do not know. 
There's just too much at stake here. Yes, in terms of color, it is easier for Dalit to pass than for African American. But that's the last of it. I mean, you know, Dalit students, and I interviewed huge numbers of Dalit students in, in colleges and, and universities and schools in various parts of India, just because I was, I was trying to talk to everywhere, as many people as I could. Dalit students would say to me repeatedly, but we are darker than the, than the upper caste. It was self-evidently wrong. And you could see that they were so mixed that there was no way of telling, and that you will meet Dalit people from you know, the lowest caste who are blue-eyed and blonde-haired and you know, tall and strapping like any you know, Punjabi upper caste person that you, that you might meet. But their own sense of themselves was we are darker. Now you've got to work with that. You know, the body is marked in all sorts of ways. That's already marking the body in a way that you know, we wouldn't be able to make a comparison. So I won't go on from that to Jerry's. I, I won't talk about the curriculum and so on. I mean, there are wonderful questions and, and you know, it's worth thinking about. I, I don't have immediate answers, certainly, but I think we would we'd need to think about it. So from, it'll follow from that, uh, Jerry, that I am not so sure that I would take Buddhism uh, and think about the poem to God uh, that, you know, the black woman writes. And that, that, that's a powerful formulation. It's the kind of formulation that Viola and many others have had repeatedly. Uh, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, Buddhism, I'm not at all sure how it functions. One of uh, your questions, Jim, was, is there a Dalit awakening which embraces much that you know, they've, they're looking to discard, have been forced to discard. And the answer is, that's the first thing that strikes you about the Dalit struggle as compared to the African-American struggle. Music is not a large part of the Dalit struggle. They played the drums traditionally in weddings and all sorts of festivals. And the first thing they want to discard is the drum. And they say it repeatedly, that this is what we have been tarred with. This leather has made us untouchables we will have nothing to do with it. And so, you know, you're in, in very different worlds. And this is because the contexts are very different. It is also because the Dalits are still not uh, identifiable as a community. 400 years of slavery and other things, segregation and so on and so forth, have produced something that is marked as the African-American community, that marks itself as the African-American community. However much its borders might be muddied and so on and so forth, there is no such Dalit community automatically. There is a Dalit aspiration, a politics, and small numbers of people who describe themselves as Dalits. The vast majority of people of ex-untouchable background do not call themselves Dalits and would not accept that. In small areas, like the areas from where, from where I've taken these autobiographies that you all read, Western India, Maharashtra, the, the leaders of the Dalit movement, in those small areas, some more privileged Dalit castes have got the best benefits of government support, of reservations, uh, affirmative action, and so on. All other Dalit castes say, why are you calling us Dalits? We're not Dalit. Those people are Dalit. They've got the benefits. We have not. We don't call ourselves Dalits, and so on and so forth. So in a, in a, in a really quite uh, difficult way, Buddhism, Buddhism is categorically, very strongly for Ambedkar, a civic religion. It is the religion of the modern. It is not a religion. It is reason. <laughs> it is, so I mean, there's something extraordinary about that. And the vast majority of Dalits who are religious uh, Dalits, that is, political activists, will, will, uh, are only nominally Buddhist. It doesn't mean very much to them. The, uh, Buddhism means anti-Hinduism, anti-upper caste Brahman Hinduism. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. And so we're starting with something very, very different. The resources of Buddhism is not what they're even looking for here. They're looking for the resources of modern to challenge the resources of Brahman. And Buddhism is the name that is given to the modern. So Ambedkar actually says this repeatedly. It says, liberty, equality, fraternity. That's my great slogan. But I didn't get it from the French Revolution. I got it from the Buddha. That's, that's the way he describes it. And you know, there's something very complex and interesting going on there. But uh, anyhow, in the same way, Dalit Panthers, I, I say in the book, and it's an important invocation, 
of that moment of militancy, that moment of rejection of nonviolence. You know, we will not, we, we're not going to surrender easily to these kinds of namby family policies that you're, you're prescribing to us. Having said that, one would want to stop a moment and think, well, Dalit Panthers, does that speak to? Who does that speak to? And in the same way, when you say Martin Luther King and Gandhi, Marcus Garvey and Ambedkar, I would want to uh, make this relationship one that, that flows in many directions, and that's very uncertain. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Um, took Gandhi as, as an inspiration. The Dalits today hate Gandhi. They, they really despise the man for the fact that he called them children of God. If we are children of God, whose, whose children are you? You know, this, this kind of thing. And there's a kind of, it, it, Ambedkar, Black Panthers, yes. Um, for for uh, Black Panthers, meaning the, the black power struggle here uh, in, the, in the 1970s. Ambedkar, Du Bois, he was trying to make that connection. Ambedkar, democracy making those sorts of connections. And I think the specificity, the struggle, the, the complexity of each one of these articulations is what one would want to bear in, in mind. I love the, what you say about Negro women as great thinkers and doers. And, and that would apply to Dalit women uh, and men to, to, uh, to a large extent. What I, what I did in that uh, chapter on Viola in the end, I, I used Zora and um, Alice Walker really just as an invitation. They invite us to do some things, and I, I follow them. I went into the Emory archives, the manuscripts and, uh, and um, rare books collection in Emory, because I thought, when I'd begun this work, I needed to do something that American historians do, go into the archive, right? Uh, even though there was so much published work, I could just have worked on the published stuff, published documents, published autobiographies. You know, I I'd never would have needed to go into an archive, but I felt, no, let me just get the feel of this thing, get some sense of uh, documents and, and papers that my Americanist colleagues work with. And I said, let me start with A. And I got only as far as A, because I got the Andrews, you know, hundreds of boxes of papers of this one family. And so in some senses, while I would like, and I'm you know, very aware of how many others one could sit by their side, I haven't done justice to them yet. Uh, I'm now writing, trying to write, uh, the biography of an autobiography, Viola's work. I want to write a book about that because, again, colleagues very generously when they read that chapter said, Jan, you've got to write this book. It's a very different sort of uh, study. And so that's what I hope I'll do. Uh, the, the last thing I want to say is um, in relation to Jim's thing about giving the vote and taking it away. And you know, the cries of corruption is absolutely right. That's exactly what's happening uh, and, and has happened very widely in India recently. But once again, context is absolutely critical. Today, the way in which cries of corruption work is you try, if possible, to damn certain kinds of politicians, certain kinds of political practice and, and groups by saying, look how utterly corrupt they are, even though uh, this really spreads right across the spectrum and has become much worse, much more open, and, and the scale is phenomenal all around. Uh, as I say, in the United States as well as in India. But the move to deny them the vote can no longer be one of denying them the vote. You cannot deny them the vote any longer. The world has changed too much. You are selling the vote to the whole world, right? So what has happened is you build another economy. And what the upper castes in India and the upper classes, traditionally privileged groups have done, is moved out of India into a world economy. And there are two economies functioning. So that there is an economy for those who are successful and who have the vote in India, who live by resources that are much, much smaller, much lower, much more um, uh, intangible, really. Uh, and resources that compare with the resources of any country in the world and people anywhere else in the world. The children of the rich in India look no longer to India. It happens to be where they are. They're looking everywhere else. The world is now the global world. We are global citizens. That, that's what's happened there. So it is the cry of corruption. But once again, I would just say, it cannot lead to taking away the vote. It's not possible anymore. We have uh, about eight minutes left. Oh,
Modernity gives him the vocabulary of rights, whereas nothing in the, in the pre-modern forms of um, of um, conduct, vocabulary, um, uh, ethics, you don't get that part of the language of rights. Um, and I, it seems to me um, a lot of what Jan was saying was that um, modernity's promise of right itself is a very illusory one. Right? Yeah. So let's see how Gary reacts to this. But, uh, you want to add? I just want to add to that. Uh, that's exactly what I want to also. The fact that what do you think Addison and Baker also realized about it in the latter half uh, that made him so turn to Buddhism, I mean, progressive? The, uh, are you saying turn to Buddhism is anti modern? Thing? Not anti modern, but I think there's a. There's but it's the only civic religion. And Amartya Sen once said, interestingly, the only religion he could have embraced in his life was Buddhism. Yeah, but because the vocabulary of Buddhism is yes. so consistent with modernity, yeah, yeah. right? So it's not an anti-modern term, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. okay. It's a religion, all right. Okay. Shall I just yeah. take yeah. Of, uh, Rajiv, thank you for the question. Um, and it's a, it's a question that one would need to talk about at great length, as you have already seen. Um, I, I would say two things, perhaps, that, that uh, uh, enough, enough, uh, hopefully, are enough uh, as a starting point. First, I think it's important for us to fold into contemporary debates those advances that have taken place. The bourgeois liberal discourse of rights is now part of the common sense of the world. And nobody is suggesting, or nobody should suggest, that this is not something we, we want to embrace. I think it is already folded into what is human right for everybody. Okay. We want to start with that. Um, in other words, there's no question of saying, let's reject modernity. Let's reject, reject the bourgeois revolution. Let's reject all the advances of democracy. That's, that, that's the last place to start. No Dalit, no African American, no disadvantaged community would ever support you in that. And you, we would be anybody who suggested that would be stupid to suggest. Even Gandhi, who's a thinker of a very different kind, because he's a very religious thinker, remember. He's a person who says faith is superior to reason. 
my belief in God is superior to anything that you can prove to me historically. So he's, he's a thinker of a kind that most of us are not. We would have to take that on board if we were to try and understand Gandhi, and that's not something we could be we going to be able to do right, right now. Even Gandhi, though, I want to say, did not reject bourgeois democracy, democracy for India. He is looking for democratic practice that would be more than one man, one vote, or one person, one vote. He's looking for a bourgeois democracy that would be more than a little bit of a, a cover, you know, parliament, just by having the institutions you don't achieve. And so he struggles to talk about Panchayat Raj. He talks about local level, basic democracy in all sorts of ways. These are important moves. They are very, good, very important questions. They're not easy questions to deal with. Some of them have been integrated into Indian political development not always successfully, but sometimes very effectively. I mean, 33% of votes for, uh, of reservations for women in panchayats all over the country has made a huge difference to the power that women have in the villages and small towns. It's really made, made a difference. So there's all sorts of things happening. But we leave Gandhi at that. Gandhi's vocabulary, his language, is a language that's actually very difficult to penetrate. We want, we want to take it seriously when we take it. Ambedkar is more accessible because he's our kind of person. He's self-declared modernist. He's of the rational world. He's, he believes in bourgeois democracy. He believes in the end in a socialist kind of democracy. That's what he really wants. He wants non-violent socialism, which is kind of an interesting formulation. So he's taking things from Gandhi and so on. So on. There, the second thing I would say to you is, um, fo following something that I think uh, Ashutosh was just asking, is the conversion to Buddhism then an anti-modernist move? And it's not only because of the kind of thing that Buddhism is. Is the emergence of right-wing Christian fundamentalism anti-modernist? Is the emergence of a Hindu right-wing politics in India fascist, which it is? Which it is? is it anti-modernist? And I would suspect that the answer is no. Unfortunately, modernism can, you know, has, has a home for all of these things, including Nazi Germany. Very modernist, I mean, sadly. Okay. So I don't think that's a non it's an anti modern move. I think it's a struggle to realize, if you like, dignity, self respect and political constituency for a new Dalit movement of, of a very different kind. So I wouldn't see these as, as separate the two things I would simply say let us fold the great advances of bourgeois democracy into what we have already got, into any demands that we make. And let us recognize that modernity allows and indeed plays upon all kinds of things that it calls relics, things from the past, which in fact it's manufacturing and using all the time. Can I say, I should just a bit Yes, sure. Um, I wanted to say that I think there's a way that we might think about religion is it's always some pure thing that's sitting somewhere, some tradition. And that's not true of the African American church. I've learned it's not true of Buddhism. I think the important question following uh, Professor Pante's uh, suggestion is we want to think about comparative but with specificity. And we want to think about these things in the hands of people who are using them for particular purposes. They're not snatching from some 7,000 years ago, this is the way this was, and 500 years ago, who did this, who is it? No, they are using religion to shape part of their answer to their contemporary conditions, which are always coeval with the rest of the world. It's not happening in some linear past, and then nobody's using religion that way. So you can just add to that. Specificity is absolutely beautiful. See, so the, the thing about the, um, what should we say, the deployment of resources that come from religion, or of a religious discourse, this itself can be marked very, very different. For African Americans, for very large numbers, Viola, for example, speaks from the Bible. The Bible is central to the construction of a life and the construction of dreams and so on. So the Bible, an ancient resource, a central text for this particular religious uh, tradition, is absolutely central to her building, her political aspiration and struggle. In the case of the Dalits, First of all, there is no central text. The Indian traditions do not have a church, do not have a, a Bible, do not have a text, etc. But secondly, more important, my, my 
resources. The thing that the Dalits draw from the Buddhist tradition is its anti-caste character. It's the one tenet that counts. The rest is that. So the fact that the soul transmigrates is something that this is fundamental Buddhism. Ambedkar rejects it. That fundamental attendant of Buddhism is not part of what Ambedkar takes on itself. Like African Americans don't take the part that says to the master, the slave should be obedient to the master. Just glide over that and go straight to the one that talks about, tell Pharaoh, leave me out of here. <laughs> That's the part <laughs> That's I want. Um, may I um, seek your indulgence for five more minutes? There's one question that Mother Mitha asked that I wanted to ask, and I want to push Gyan a little bit more on that. And that question is, whether the Dalit, uh, the, whether the da Indian Dalits can escape their misery more easily than African Americans can, that particular question. And um, she argued, in my view, and, and then I'll say what some others have said. She argued that the Dalit category is not racially constituted. It's not written on your face or in your head. It's not inscribed in your head. When you're in the way your nose is. Um, and and uh, Kian's answer to that was that while that may be in some sense true, but that let's say even when they're uh, lighter than upper caste, which is true in many parts of India, the upper castes come in all kinds of colors and, and Dalits come in all kinds of colors. You know that's not a racially constituted category. So uh, that Kian's answer was that uh, no, the Dalits themselves say that they are darker, even when they may be lighter than the Subramanian uh, or the Sharma, which are very typical uh, Brahmin names, and sitting next to them. Hmm? Now, Ambedkar would support Madhubita, Gyan, no? Am Am Ambedkar is saying that the city more or less is the site of liberation and village is a cesspool. Village is a cesspool because if 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 the if the if the caste is not written on your face, then you but you nonetheless know the caste of a person. It's because you know the person. It's such a small setting. You know the person, therefore you know the caste, right? Whereas if you arrive in the city of Mumbai, you become be, begin to become part of a community. You begin to travel in trains and in buses and go to work settings where people may not know very, uh, uh, whether you know that it's not inscribed in your face. Now, don't you think, um, uh, I mean, Ambedkar does make the, uh, the claim that Madhubita is making. What is your response to that, um, the idea that city actually is a site of liberation? Yeah. Madhubita, you should be answering this question. It's addressed to you. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm actually following up. <laughs> Uh, once again, we, we want to hold on to both things. I want to hold on to both things. I have no doubt in my mind that the city is a site of liberation. And a site of, well, the North was a site of liberation. By African Americans, there was a liberation. The North was a site of you know, a pro the promised land, which wasn't always delivering on its promise. The city, too, is in that sense a place where things can happen. Your original question is, the city is a place of anonymity by comparison. And it's a place where opportunities open up. It's a place where denial is much more difficult. There are restaurants, there are trains, where I mean, you know, there are funny stories of the early, early trains and Dalits and others you get onto. They'll push up against the people next to them to make, to, to make them lose caste. <laughs> and, uh, but the fact of the matter is, we need to get back to that question. The, the question you asked right at the beginning. Is it going to be as difficult for Dalits to get out of the subordinated, stigmatized position, status that they have, as it has been for, for example, African Americans? Or in India, it is for people from the Northeast, just simply because they actually appear different. This is the question we must ask, and the answers are difficult. It is not that the city has not helped. The city helps enormously. It is not that democracy has not helped. It has actually transformed the possibilities and it has made it very difficult for police stations to refuse to take Dalit complaints seriously. Right. 
They still refuse many, many times. But there are many occasions when they're scared that some politician, some, some big shot, might actually come and take their jobs from them. So policemen will now take, pay more attention, right? So, because the lower level bureaucracy, but also the chief minister, the top executive in the province, might well be a valid. Things are changing. These are resources that are of enormous value, and we want to fold them into the struggle, in, into our understanding of the stage of the struggle. We have to recognize that for all that, there is still this understanding that those people don't really belong here. So that the Dalit doctor, and there are many, many Dalit uh, doctors, practitioners of medicine, that you go to is constantly facing the church. When you come back, somebody will say to you, are you mad? You went to that fellow, that doctor? Do you know how he became a doctor? He became a doctor out of affirmative action. He's a quota doctor. He's a doctor because there was a quota reserved from him. He's just not good enough. He'll kill you. Now, you may have heard this. I have heard it in home after home after home. That doctor has not escaped because somewhere his background emerges. The background is that he came at some time from a Dalit background. These people are not doctors. They don't have minds. Okay. So in all sorts of ways, that question of where are you from? Which part of the country do you come from? What did your ancestors do? How you speak? Your accent. One generation doesn't change the accent completely. And it's very often difficult for the first generation of Dalit middle class people to pass on the resources and privileges of that middle class status and that middle class uh, comfort to the next generation. People fall back. People, they don't have big libraries. They don't have comfortable homes. They have relatives who speak different ways. So that your speech will still continue to, to mark you. There are all kinds of things there are, which are being marked right, as indicating where you are from and where you actually belong. So while it is different, it's certainly different from something that just tells you on your face, it is not that easily marked, uh, separated, you know, what your background is, what your demeanor is, what your accent is, <coughs> what, uh, uh, indeed, how you express your confidence. I have seen senior Dalit uh, officers very aggressive in their responses to other people because they were being ill-treated. So an aggression comes out. And you can tell immediately from the aggression that's a Dalit officer. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. So, let's say the last word is yours. How about that? Um, right. Well, I, I wonder about this all the time because um, so I teach a lot of the memoirs like Jadavs, which you talked about, and um, the solution almost always at the end is that the person who's writing it has become a teacher or even a factory worker, an economist or something like that. And there are often these comments about, I'm so glad I don't have to do that horrible work that my cast group has to do. Meanwhile, you're aware that everyone else who's been mentioned is still doing that work, right? And so the question in a way is, will, a, say, a sweeper in India always be stable? Right? regardless of what you can prove about biological inheritance. Because it seems to me that the, the kind of the visible immediacy of discrimination on, uh, on racial grounds in this country can create certain kinds of cross-class, cross-profession solidarity. Whereas in a lot of the stuff that you're getting, such as the Jada memoir, the solution is often a kind of professional advancement. Right? And so that you've solved a problem that perhaps not all of us have to be born into these professions that we don't want to be in. But the profession remains a source of stigma. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think you've said several things there which, which actually help answer this question. I, sorry, I will take the last one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, simply to say that if several generations can live the life of comfort and of the elite, they can escape. There is no question. Nobody can mark it. Part of the struggle, the African American struggle as well as the Dalit struggle, is to embrace names that were once stigmatized. That's part of the answer to your question of do they embrace anything. They've embraced names of the lowest castes so that they're still marked. Okay? So this is one part. Uh, that, that, that the fact of their being marked by those names is something they would have to struggle with against for, for a long time. The second thing is 
that sweepers, if sweepers continue to be people who carry shit on their heads, then they will be stigmatized. If, when the society is transformed into flush toilets for everybody, then it may not go. It will not be stigmatized, it will not exist, that particular occupation. But the critical one for the jadas and for all the other professional emotions, the jadas are really truly exceptional because the, the family, that particular bit of the family has moved out. But even the rest of the jadas family and all the other uh, professions that, that you're talking about, who become teachers or doctors or, or bureaucrats, they still have all those relatives and all those connections with people who are working in stigmatized occupations. And they will often, I've had people very angry with me because I described them, them as middle class. They said, how can you describe us as middle class? We're not middle class in any sense. They were, <laughs> so, so, but I, I finished. I wasn't saying anything of any consequence. <laughs> Simply saying, but I think when you've had, and in this instance, it's, it's really hundreds and hundreds of years of discrimination and of thinking society in particular ways, thinking particular practices as demeaning. It's not a quick fix. It's going to take a long time. It will not be, and obviously it will not be. These are very different circumstances, different kinds of stigmatization. But it's hard to get out of the situation of being lower class, underclass people and being stigmatized with when you are primarily lower class, underclass people. Still, it's when those communities are, to a large extent, no longer lower class, then the stigma will have disappeared. Well, this, uh, this brings us to the end of this uh, most engaging afternoon. It's time to thank uh, Jan Pandey for his talk and the discussion. Time to thank Kiri Augusto and Madhumeda Lahiri and Jim Maroon for their comments, and we invite you to, to a reception outside.